y'all. Welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella, and like most millennials, I've always had an obsession with true crime. On KQ, you'll find light true crime stories, millennial hypes and gripes, some adult language, and maybe a special guest here and there. Just like a 90s sleepover, we're just a couple BFFs hanging out. So gather round and let's launch right into it. This episode contains discussion of murder by gunshot, mentions of suicide, and mentions of child abuse. Listener discretion is advised. All right, you guys, uh, welcome back to another episode and get ready to throw everything that you own, everything that you love, everyone you love right out the window. Okay. We teach emotional regulation on this podcast and to regulate the emotions and the anger and the rage that you're going to feel and how senseless and entitled this woman is and how stupid her boyfriend is. Everything's going out the window. I don't know what to tell you. You had a good run. Okay. That's all there is to it. Before we get into the case, I do want to give a Hey Girl thanks to Kelsey M for requesting this one and Mark for writing it up. And there are a couple things you can watch on this. Uh, There's a Snapped Killer Couples. You can watch that a bunch of places. And there's a dateline on this and it's a long dateline. It's one of the, with commercials, it's like two hours, probably about an hour and a half long, um, actually. And Dennis is the host of this one. And I got to tell you, Dennis was fucking serving in this one. Okay. It was great. And, you know, Dennis, I don't think it's enough credit. And as our friends over on Date with Dateline would say, Dennis is enough. Okay. And he, he brought it. Charlene was like, bring it on. And he was like, oh, it's already been brought in. Okay. So great stuff. Let's go to the beginning though. Today's episode is taking us to upstate New York. This is Northwest of Syracuse to a small town called Sodus, New York. Sodus sits near the shores of Lake Ontario with a population that varies between eight to 9,000 over the past few decades of census data. So It is not huge. It is no bigger than your mama's Jack Russell. Josh Niles was born in 1990, and he grew up in a household that was always full of kids. There were five kids in the household, but sometimes there were even more. When they had like friends stay over, one of his sisters said it wasn't uncommon for them to be 10 plus kids in the house at any given time on, and that's a typical day. That's not like, wow, one of my kids had a sleepover birthday party. That's like on a Tuesday. Josh's parents worked constantly to make ends meet, so the children were close-knit. They looked out for each other. Josh loved his family. Growing up, he wasn't the type to be like lovey-dovey, mushy, anything like that, but his family said that he would show that he loved you by doing things for you. Sounds like he was an acts of service kind of guy. If someone needed help with a task, he was the first to pitch in. He was also really protective of his family, and if someone had a problem with one of his siblings, He wasn't going to hesitate to get involved and defend them. You know, you can say what you want about me, but you're not going to talk about my brother or sister. When Josh was in high school, uh, he was around 17 years old. He met Charlene Albert, who was 15 at the time. They got into a relationship. They fell in love really quickly. Josh actually moved her into their home. And when his mother didn't object, she just stayed. And again, that's kind of, how their house was. It was like there were always people staying over. It seemed like kind of that place that like all your friends feel super safe to go to and to be at and whatever. So when somebody needed help or a place to stay, his parents were like, yeah, you know, we know they're safe here. Like that's fine with us. So she just sort of became part of the family. She moved in and that was it. After they'd been together for A year to a year and a half, Charlene ends up getting pregnant and they were both super excited. So in 2008, they welcomed their first child, a little girl named Gabby. And they're both young, right? I mean, they're very young, but they were super excited about becoming parents and having a family. And then two years later, they had a second child, a boy named Bentley. But again, they're very young. So if she was 16 
when she got pregnant with their first child, they're very young. They're, they've become parents at a very, very young age. Josh is still very young at this point. And now having two children and they're this young and just everything else going on, it put a strain on their relationship. They were fighting a lot more. And by 2012, they end up splitting up. So Charlene's parents had moved from New York to Texas. So shortly after they split up, Charlene moves to Texas as well. This was difficult for Josh, but they had worked out a custody agreement and they seemed to be very cordial. Uh, They seemed to co-parent very well during this time. So Charlene moves to Texas and they agree that Every other Christmas, they would alternate who got the kids. And Charlene would have them like during the school years. But then for summers, he would drive down, pick them up from Texas, drive them back up to New York, and they'd spend the summers with him and his family. And for a few years, that worked great. They seemed to, it seemed to work for both of them. Um, They really didn't have a lot of problems. His family felt like that was going well. So after Charlene moves to Texas, she meets a man named Jace Childers, and she ends up marrying him. They had a child together, and they seemed very happy. Things were going well. That same year, Josh meets a girl named Amber Washburn through some of his friends. His mom remembers talking to Josh after he first met her, and Josh was like, I've never met anyone like her. I think I'm already in love with her. Like, he loved her immediately. And family and friends were like, we loved her immediately. She was great with him, for him, great with his children. They were great together. They seemed to uplift each other rather than bring out the worst in each other, right? Amber had grown up in upstate New York in a close-knit family as well. Her sister says that even though there was a nine-year age difference between her and Amber, they were still very close. Amber was very sweet, very kind, loving to anyone she met. Amber's mom said that when they met Josh, they also loved him right away, welcomed him right into the family. I mean, they were just like, it was like they both fit so seamlessly in each other's lives. It was like they'd always been there, you know? He was very sweet. He was very kind. He treated Amber the way that they would want somebody to treat her. He was the kind of guy who would stop anything that he was doing and come help them if they called him. Amber and Josh ended up moving in together, and as the summers began to roll around, Amber got to know Gabby and Bentley as well. One of Josh's brothers said that Amber took care of the children as if they were her own flesh and blood. She never tried to overstep any boundaries and replace Charlene as their mother, but they knew that she was there for them, and Amber was another mother to them. In 2014, Josh and Amber learned that Amber was pregnant, and they had a little boy that they named Josh Jr., They end up, shortly after that, purchasing their first home together. Amber worked at a bakery overnight, and Josh was working with a landscaping company. But Josh wanted to start his own business, Niles Landscaping, so he could provide even more for his family. They were planning on having a big family. They were planning on getting married. Things were going great for them. They were so proud of the life that they were building together. Their families were so proud of them. They were so happy for them. Like It was like, they had this kind of fairy tale, you know, they wanted a simple life and they had it and it was so happy. But on October 22nd, 2018, that all changed. Around 2 p.m., a neighbor of Josh and Amber's was in her kitchen. When she looks out her window and she sees Josh talking to another man in the driveway, she doesn't recognize the man. She says at first glance, it seems that this man and Josh are just talking casually. It does not seem heated in any way. It doesn't seem, she thinks nothing of it. Amber is pulling in the driveway at the same time. And the neighbor turns around to grab a snack for her daughter because she's in the kitchen. And when she turns her head, she starts hearing gunshots. And she's like, what the heck? So she looks out the window and she sees Josh grabbing his chest. Amber puts her car in reverse and she tries to back out and drive past the shooter. But as she drives by, he shoots her in the head. 
Her car slowly idled down their driveway and came to a stop in their neighbor's driveway. The shooter then walked back to where Josh was. So Josh had been shot once in the chest at this point, and he's trying to climb under his truck because he had been outside working on his truck at this time. So he's dragging himself under the truck to try to get away from the shooter. And the guy walks back over to him and shoots him multiple times, multiple, multiple times. The man then fled through their yard. He jumps over a fence and then he disappears. So she calls 911. There happened to actually be an officer already in the neighborhood who was supervising an eviction notice in the area. He had also heard the shots. So he was making his way to the scene. He was like running, trying to get through. He gets the call. They notify him. He's like, I'm en route. I heard it. You know, he says as he approached, there were people coming up to him and he didn't know if they were involved or, you know, if one of them might have been the shooter, even like he, you know, he doesn't know what he's walking into. There's gunshots. He doesn't know what's happening. He saw the car idling across the road and approached and found Amber deceased. And she was like slumped over the center console of the car from a gunshot. You guys, this part is absolutely heartbreaking. He looks in the back seat and Amber and Josh's four-year-old son, Josh Jr., was in the back seat. He's clutching his four-piece chicken McNugget meal that he was eating when all of this had started. He is alive. He is okay. But he witnessed both of his parents being murdered. Four years old. That's, how do you do that to somebody? How do you do any of it to somebody? But to know there's a baby in the back seat? I guess at least they didn't shoot the child, but my God, you know? The officer grabs Josh Jr. and leaves him with a neighbor while other officers arrived. So witnesses are telling them the man they're looking for is wearing a black sweatshirt. He's got a green hat. They pointed the officers in the direction that he ran in. They all described him as a slender man, and some got a good enough look to say that he had a beard. Officers used canines to try to track the shooter's scent and found a baklava face mask, but they realized the shooter had made it outside of the perimeter that they had set up at that point, and now there's a shooter at large. News of the shooting spread very quickly because remember, this town is no bigger than your mama's Jack Russell. One of Josh's sisters saw it on Facebook and recognized the street as Josh and Amber's. Can you imagine? I'm scrolling Facebook and somebody who I know and love, their street is showing up as a double, double homicide with caution tape all around it. Like, that's terrifying. She called the police and said, hey, that's really close to my brother's house. What is going on? They said, well, what's your brother's name? She said, Josh Niles. And they said, look, I don't have any information I can give you right now, but an officer's going to be in touch with you. She's like, I knew then that it was Josh. Because otherwise, why would they have to call her back, I guess? I don't know. She knew. She knew. Oh, so sad. The family was later informed that a shooting had taken place and that Josh had been killed. And they said, what about Amber? Was Amber home? And they were like, she's been killed as well. And they were like, oh my gosh. And then of course, they're freaking out. Where is Josh Jr.? Is the baby okay? Like what's going on? So they were able to, you know, find out that he was okay, but that he had witnessed it. And so when officers tried to talk to him to see what if they could get anything out of him, if he saw anything, if you know, they learned that he was non-verbally autistic and he wasn't able to tell them anything. And he's four and, pro- and traumatized anyway, um, but he wasn't able to tell them anything. Investigators talked with friends and family to try to figure out who would want to hurt Josh and Amber. Nothing about this made sense to anyone. They could not think of anybody that would want to hurt Josh and Amber like this. They had no enemies. Uh, Josh was starting his business. It was taking off. They were getting ready to get married pretty soon. So it just didn't make any sense to anybody. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet is Gabby and Bentley, remember, they normally were with Josh just during the summers. And this is not the summer. This is during school. They were with Josh and Amber at the time. They were at school when the shooting took place. But remember, this isn't part of their custody agreement. So what are they doing there in October? Well, 
we have to give you a little background on Charlene. So remember, she had moved to Texas. She had gotten married. Her now ex-husband, Jace, says that he met her about two weeks after she moved to Texas. A month later, they found out she was pregnant. They got married really quickly. Their life was going smoothly. Charlene at that time was working in the animal control department of their local town, which operated under the police department. So while working there, Charlene meets a man named Tim Dean, who was the police chief at the time. They became friends. They'd chit-chat at work, and then it developed into a relationship, except that they were both married at the time. So Jason and Charlene ended up divorcing January 29th, 2018, and Charlene and Tim got married on March 10th the same year. At some point in, during that time period, he and his wife got a divorce too, obviously, but I don't have the date of that. After their marriage, Charlene and Tim's relationship hit a speed bump in the spring of 2018. You might call it like, what's bigger than a speed bump? Um, you might call it, um, what are those sharp things the police throw out with tires? Tire sharpies? You might call it tire sharpies. I don't know what they're called. You know, the things that like poke your tires out, tire sharps. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Anyway, this is a big fucking speed bump, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So Tim, in the spring of 18, became under investigation by the Department of Public Safety and Child Protective Services. Now remember, he is the police chief. They have a child together. No, wait, they don't have a child together. That was her and Jace. That's right. She got pregnant by Jace pretty quickly. So forget that. They don't have a child together. She has kids. He has kids. At least one. But he was being investigated for neglect and child abuse of a child from a previous relationship when a cell phone video showed him hitting his three-year-old daughter. She's three years old. He gets angry with her and slaps her across the face. This ended up going public because Charlene posted it on Facebook, which, I mean, I'm glad it, it went public, but like, if you're concerned, report it. Don't just post it on Facebook and hope something happens. Something did happen. People saw it, and then Child Protective Services became involved. Thank goodness. But like, what the fuck? So Tim ended up resigning from his position as police chief. And he ended up getting a job working as a delivery driver for Frito-Lay. In May of 2018, Josh was on his way to pick his kids up for the summer, like he did every year. And he ends up getting a call from CPS in Texas. And they say, look, Josh, sorry, Charlene and Tim lost custody of his other children because of these child abuse charges. And we feel like you need to know because your children are also in that home. So do with that what you will. And so Josh was like, okay. So he files for immediate temporary custody and it was granted very quickly. And, you know, by all accounts, he's just trying to do the right thing for his children. If this man is abusing his own child, let me tell you something. I recently learned that the number one predictor of abuse in a household, the number one predictor, and you can, it, physical abuse, sexual abuse, which is also physical, but um, emotional abuse, psychological, any type of abuse. And if you, if you think the, the main indicators would be previous abuse of that person, like they've been abused and so now they like all of these other things that could be the reason why a person might abuse, the number one predictor is none of those that you're thinking. It is the presence of a step-parent in a home. More times than not a stepfather. But that, a step-parent being in the home, is so much more likely to indicate abuse that it outweighs any other cause you can think of combined. So Tim is his children's essentially stepfather because they're living together. So, well, and they're married. It is his stepfather, their stepfather. I keep forgetting who she married and who she didn't marry. It's like a whole thing. So that is their stepfather. So yeah, he's like, mm, I don't think so. 
we're going to come get, I'm getting my kids. I'm making sure that they're safe. So in August of 2018, Josh petitioned the courts for full custody of his children, and this infuriated Charlene. She went to New York several times to try to get the children back. And so that is why they were in New York at the time of the murders. Normally they wouldn't have been, but there is a big, fat, superseding incident that caused them to be there, which I think you've already figured out is big fat related to the murders. At the crime scene, everything was processed and detectives began to knock on every door. They're talking to anybody who could have seen anything. They were able to get video from home security cameras across the neighborhood and got shots of a man walking past who matched the descriptions they were given from the witnesses. It appeared that he had been watching Josh before moving in to attack him. Like he'd been kind of casing everything. One would think that if he was going to case everything, he would have chosen a time when everybody wasn't outside watching him. And also maybe a time that a police officer wasn't right down the street supervising an eviction. Like, but hey, you know, thank goodness he didn't. Detectives called Charlene and they're like, hey, like, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm on my way up to New York to get my kids. I just found out that Josh has been killed. And so I'm on the way up there to get them. And they're like, that's super weird. How did you know about that? She's like, oh, well, um, I saw a photo of a crime scene on Facebook and it was a picture of Josh's house. And so I called his mom and his mom was like, yeah, Josh has been killed. And she was like, and I hit the floor. I mean, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. So, you know, obviously I have to come get my kids or whatever. And they were like, huh. So they're like, well, what's your relationship with Josh like? Like, tell us about that. She's like, well, you know, um, you know, we've had our fair share of problems, but you know, that's my son. That's my kid's dad. Like, obviously I wouldn't wish this on anyone. He's a great dad to them, you know, blah, blah, blah. She's like, um, we've come to a place of understanding now, but it wasn't always that way. He would have anger issues unless he had his drugs. And they're like, what kind of drug? She's like, Pat, Pat. I can't even do it how New York people say it, pot. And she was like, if he didn't have his pot, he was angry and he was, you know, all of these things. And he would get violent with me. And she said that this was back when Gabby and Bentley were born. And she said that she even warned Amber, like, hey, look out for his temper because it gets really bad and you're not going to know why he flips out. He's just going to flip out. He's just going to lose it, fly off the handle, and he might do some shit to you. But, you know, just watch out for that. Like, I felt like I needed to let her know how dangerous he was. Two days after the murders, a candlelit vigil was held with friends, family, and community members. And Charlene is on the fucking news talking about how tragic it is that her children now have to grow up without a father. I would never wish that on anyone. You know, this is my children's father. They should never have to go through this. Who could take someone away that has children? It's terrible. While she was there, there was a man named Casey who was with her. And from everyone's perspective, they looked like they were dating. Casey was consoling her. And when they met at Josh's family's home, he was there. When detectives asked Josh's family about Charlene, they all said that all the stuff she said about Josh wasn't true. And it was Charlene that had the hair trigger temper. And she had 911 on speed dial. And she would call them anytime she didn't get her way. If she wasn't getting what she wanted in that moment, she would call 911 and say that he'd been abusing her. So, and they said they liked her when she, they first started dating. But as time went on, they all told Josh the same thing. You need to end this and move on. It's not working. It's not good. It's toxic. It's not going to end well. When they finally separated and were a thousand miles away from each other, that's when their relationship finally started to settle and they started to get along. And they came, you know, they came to that custody agreement that they both agreed on and, and all the stuff. Detectives had asked Charlene to come in and talk once she was in town and settled with her children. They were suspicious of her, but they did confirm that she was nowhere near New York at the time of the shootings. She was at work, so couldn't have been that. Okay, but let's look at Casey. He lives here. What's that about? 
they thought maybe he could have done it to gain favor with Charlene. She and Casey had known each other for a while. He was actually arrested at the age of 19 for having a relationship with Charlene when she was 14. So he was a registered sex offender because of this. So they talked to Casey and he said that he was Charlene's boyfriend, but he didn't know anything about the shooting. When he left, he went to his friends and bragged about being the suspect in the shooting, though. And he'd even reached out to people and been like, hey, guys, uh, you know that shooting that just happened a couple days ago? I'm like totally a suspect. I'd talk to police and stuff. He's like bragging about it. Super weird. They also learned that he was actively trying to get rid of a handgun, a Glock 933 pistol, the same caliber that was used to kill Josh and Amber. It appeared to them that he was trying to capture maybe some kind of like local fame around the murders or something like that. They talked with him again. They asked about the gun. He told them that he had gotten it from Charlene. She had it when she came to get the kids because she had a permit to carry it in Texas, but not in New York. So she accidentally brought it with her. And when she realized it, she had asked him to get rid of it. So he was reaching out to friends who had legal permits to take it. The police got the gun and tested it against the shell casings found at the scene. It was not a match, not the gun. They checked Casey's alibi as well, which checked out. He was also at work. They were able to verify that. Now, remember, Charlene might be dating Casey, but she's still married to Tim. Now, they were in the process of divorcing. She blamed Tim and his legal trouble for losing her kids. So at this point, investigators start looking into Charlene's life and her relationship with Tim and Casey. And they start to think, well, maybe if Tim is the reason that she lost her kids, maybe he thought, well, if I murder Josh and Amber, that gets rid of the problem that you have because they have custody. And then maybe you'll get back together with me and we can save our marriage. Their question became, was Tim the shooter? So they get a warrant for Tim's cell phone records to see if he was in New York at the time. They learned that he was not in Texas, but he had been 400 miles away in Kansas. <laughs> you got, you can, y'all, we can't make this shit up, okay? This man is a retired police chief. Please, please, please view all of this information through the lens that this man should fucking know how investigations work. But anyway, during the time that two people are killed, that he has a connection to, that he may have a motive to murder, and he needs to be able to prove that he's in Texas so that they don't think he did it, he drives to Kansas, and he's 400 miles away, and he's in a rental car. And he wrecks the rental car, drives through a fucking like embankment or some shit. He had tried to make a U-turn, and he hits, or like in the ditch. He hit something in the ditch, but to the point that he called 911 to report this accident, okay? I don't know if the car just wasn't drivable, or I guess he had to report it for insurance. I don't know. But anyway, you would think if you're allegedly there driving to commit a murder, don't put yourself on the radar 400 miles away from where you're supposed to be, right? So the police officer gets there. The deputy is sitting with him. He gets the vehicle's information. And there's body cam footage of this. And so he's like, why are you all the way up in Kansas if you live in Texas? And he's like, oh, my life's gone to shit. Lost my job as a cop. Working now, delivering with Frito-Lay. I'm homeless because his wife, he says, has kicked him out. He's going through a divorce. The deputy is getting a weird feeling from him. And um, he's like, you know what? Can I search the vehicle? And he's like, yes, you can. But you do need to know that I have a firearm in the vehicle, which I do have permits to carry. He said there's a shotgun in the car as well. And so the deputy called for a tow truck and, and they look and they find, they find multiple weapons though in the back. There's no ammunition, I guess, but, or they're not loaded. I can't say that there was no ammunition, but they find multiple weapons in the back seat. And the, the officer's like, you go in, hunting or something? Like, what are you doing with all these weapons? And he's like, well, I was going to go visit a family friend up in New York, but that didn't really, I'm not sure that that's going to work out. Okay. So they tow the vehicle away. 
A few days later, the deputy receives a call from the FBI and they ask about the accident because the 911 call placed about the accident had popped up in the cell phone records. So the FBI told him they're trying to create a timeline for Tim and he is a suspect in a murder investigation. And they asked if he knew where Tim was going and, you know, we need to backtrack and see if we can figure out where he went. So he went to the service center where the car was taken and they said that Tim had unloaded a tote bag full of ammo and magazines and an AR style rifle, as well as a ballistics vest. And they had security footage of Tim taking these things out. Then they told him he got into an Uber and so they go to talk to the driver. Tim told her he was carrying a shotgun and ammo. And is that a problem? Can I get in the vehicle with that? She said, well, is it loaded? He said, no, it's not loaded. She said, okay, that's not a problem. And she drives him to a Motel 6. Tim had checked out and left town already, but with no car, the deputy wasn't sure how he'd left. Now, this was a rental in the first place. So they go to the local enterprise where they recognized Tim and they wouldn't rent to him because he only had cash. He didn't have a card to put on file. He left the enterprise pretty upset, um, but they didn't know where he went after that. So kind of stuck at this point, the deputy goes back over the body cam footage that night, and there's a detail that he'd forgotten about that he had not yet told the FBI. Tim had offhandedly mentioned, remember, that he was maybe going to go see a family friend in New York. And so they relay this information to the FBI, and they're like, oh, shit. Okay. He told someone he's going to New York. He has a bunch of different guns, lots of ammo. And two people are dead in New York that he has a connection to. So they learned that Tim had another rental, which he got from a rental place at the airport. And this was 48 hours before the murders took place. Back in Texas, an arrest warrant was obtained for cause and injury to a child related to the original investigation by CPS. They used that as a way to get Tim into the station after he was arrested. He was met there by a Texas Ranger, an FBI agent who was talking with him about Amber and Josh's murder. They asked about Charlene and how she reacted to losing the children. You know, he was like, well, she wasn't happy about it, that's for sure. They told him they knew he was going to New York State around the time of the murders. And he said he was just going to go up there and he was going to try to talk to Charlene's uncle to see if he could talk some sense into her and get her to call off the divorce. But ultimately, he never did. He never made it there. He said his original plan was just to get in a car and drive far away and die by suicide. That way, anybody who found him wouldn't be somebody who cared about him. And he turned his phone off so nobody could call him and talk him out of it. But then he was going to go visit the uncle, but then he never visited them. Couldn't you call him? Does the uncle not have a phone? Could you fax him? Did you have to drive 24 hours one way to see him? I think they have, you could have emailed him. There's a lot of different page, beep him, shit, beep him. You got to do something. So they start to apply pressure and they ask him why the FBI would be there and ask him what happens when you drive across multiple states to commit a crime. (laughs) Like, again, sir, you should know this. You were the police fucking chief, okay? Like, a police officer should know it too, but like, you're supposed to know all this stuff. Tim wasn't giving him anything. He didn't confess, nothing like that. So then they talk to a friend of Tim's, a man named Bron Bowler. He comes on the radar because the name used to rent that first vehicle was Braun Bowler's name. And Tim had asked him if he could rent it for him because his credit cards were maxed out dealing with the divorce. So he was just trying to help him out. He took a polygraph and he failed that bitch. And so investigators were like, you know why he was renting that car. You need to tell us right now. Or we are going to charge you as a conspirator in the murders. So he said that he heard Tim say, Effer's gonna die when talking about Josh. That Effer's gonna die. The murder had been planned in Tim's garage. The car was rented under a different name, so he wouldn't be caught. Who's the Effer now? You rented a car in somebody else's name, and then you proceeded to call the police, who then got the information and is able to notate in his report that Tim Dean is driving the car, but the car is rented under Bron Bowler's name. And they even talked about that. And Tim was like, yeah, it's not going to be a fun phone call to make, but you know, he'll have to file it with insurance or whatever. Like, like, are you serious, dude? (laughs) Come on. They had a witness saying that 
Tim was the trigger man in the murders, but they still had this nagging feeling that Charlene was involved. They were really curious about how Charlene found out about the murders, because remember, she saw the house in Facebook photos, and she knew it was Josh's house. But when they released the photos, they never showed the house or the house number, just the street. So she says, I saw his exact house on in the pictures, and I knew it was him, so that's why I called his mom. But she didn't see that, because that was not released. Josh's house image was not released in any of those photos. So how did she know something had happened to Josh when nobody had told her about it first? Eight days after the murders, they asked her to come in and talk with them. They talked uh, about her and Josh's past, her relationship with Tim. They asked her if she thought Tim could be capable of the murders. And she's like, no, I really couldn't see it. I mean, I, I couldn't see him shooting anybody unless it was like, you know, in the line of duty and he had to protect his life or the life of someone else. I, I, don't, I don't think he could do something like that. She said, I have no idea who would have killed them. I don't know who would have wanted to do that. You know, like, yeah, we had a rough go sometimes, but that's still the father of my damn kids. So why would I kill him? That's fucking stupid. So then they were like, listen, bitch, we know that you drove Braun to pick up the rental car. Did you ask him why he needed a rental car? No. We talked, but I don't pry into people's personal lives. I mean, I just assumed he needed it for work or something. So I just, he just said he needed a ride. I gave him a ride. Okay. But you drove him to pick up the rental car. Well, yeah. Well, and first they ask her, did you drive Tim to pick up a rental car? Or did you drive anyone to pick up a rental car? I drove a friend to pick up a rental car. What's that friend's name? Braun Bowler? They're like, bingo, 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 fucking bingo. Are you kidding me? How did y'all not? This is what I don't understand. Brian Bowler is also a police officer, y'all. Charlene, dumb as a fucking rock. Throw her out the window. They're all dumb as a fucking rock. But the two other dumb as fucking rocks are in law enforcement, or at least were. And I think you'd have to know something about something to be the police chief, although one could argue maybe not in some jurisdictions. But like, Y'all thought you could have Braun Bowler rent the car, who is very much connected to both of you. And then he actually reports the use of that car <laughs> to the police. Guys, guys, can't make it up. Can't make it up. Next, they said, well, we know Tim rented a second car because remember, he wrecked the shit out of the first one. Somebody had to drive him to rent that second car, Charlene. And we know that was you. You drove him to rent the second car. She's like, okay, yeah, I did. Well, why did you do that? Well, he was stranded. I mean, I just, I couldn't just leave him like that. Like I was definitely pissed off and it was a five hour drive each way for me to get up there. And, you know, I tried to get him, like, is there anybody else you can call? Is there anything else you can do? But he couldn't. And, you know, I'm not the type of person to just leave somebody stranded. Well, did you know where he was going? No. So you just, okay. All right. So you drove Braun to rent a car, which you're aware that Tim used, right? Because he wrecked a rental car. Did he tell you he wrecked a rental car? Like, what did you think he wrecked? Because you know what his vehicle looks like. So it's, you know, the whole thing. Like, none of it fucking... Obviously, she knew he was in the car. Like, these people think that all of these officers are as dumb as they are. And it's just not... That's... You'd be hard-pressed to find somebody as dumb as you are, guys. Like, come on. So they're like, did you have anything to do with the murders? Did you put Tim up to this? And she's like, no, of course. And then after several more hours of interrogation, she was like, oh my God, okay, you got me. So basically what she says is after I lost the kids, I told Tim, I can't deal with this. I can't losing. I can't deal with losing them. I'm depressed. They're my everything. They're my whole world. Tim's like, well, what are we going to do? And she says, well, he's got to go talking about Josh. And Tim was like, fine, great. I don't care. This was just after the kids were taken and some time passed about two months. Charlene had visited the kids in New York and she said that her son was crying and begging her to take him with her. He said, he, he hates it here. I don't like it here. And she said, seeing this just put her in a different headspace. Like she was really upset about it. And so she said that she told Tim it's showtime. So she, Braun and Tim planned the murder together. 
Braun, what is you? Is she? This is some beer flavored nipples kind of shit. Okay. Is she got something going on with Braun too? What is his fucking motive? My friend needs needs help, Tim. The, you're in too deep, my dude. This is too much. Braun, get your shit together. You're in law enforcement. These people are talking about committing a murder and renting a car in your name to do it. If he gotten pulled over, you'd be fucked. What are you thinking? Tim is so fucking stupid that you could pretty much assume that if he's going up there by himself, he might lock himself out the damn car while he's out shooting people. And then the cops are going to show up and the car is just going to be sitting at the fucking murder scene with your name all over it. We thought of no possibilities of anything going wrong because what? Tim is like a mastermind. I cannot with these people. So the plan was for Tim to drive up in the rental car. He'd kill Josh. Then he'd come back to Texas and nobody would fucking knew, know that it happened or that he had anything to do with it because he would turn his phone off. <laughs> come on. <laughs> but then he wrecked the fucking car. So whoopsie, that throws a wrench in things. And that's ultimately what brought them down. Charlene ends up picking up Tim from that motel. She took him to the airport to rent the new car, gave him the debit and credit card and sent him on his way. Then she drove back to Texas and waited until she saw the news articles about a shooting in Sodus. Two weeks after the murders, Charlene and Tim were both charged for their murders. Also, if she did, sorry, like side rant, if she did actually just see a news article and like there's been a shootings in Sodus, wouldn't she begin calling Josh to find out like, hey, what's going on? That's, you know, that's a small town. That's crazy. Is it anybody we know? Are the kids okay? You'd think that would have been her first thought, but she knows the kids are okay because she knows what time it happened because she knows it's been done, right? But like, anyway, she's just like, why would you immediately just call Tim's, I'm sorry, uh, Josh's mom when you saw the article? Because you knew you weren't going to get a hold of Josh, like, idiot. Two weeks after the murders, Charlene and Tim were both charged for their for the murders. Josh and Amber's families were sickened because Charlene had sat with them. She had prayed. She'd pretended to grieve. Remember, she was there. She was there for the funerals. And she went to them. And she knew she had planned it and pretended to be heartbroken with his family. That's some diabolical shit. Charlene and Tim were facing life in prison initially, but when Charlene's statements to the police were deemed admissible in court, her attorney reached out to the prosecutor about a deal because now they're fucked, right? The DA offered her manslaughter in exchange for testifying against Tim, which I really don't know why they did that because they had plenty on Tim. He was going to get convicted, I think, no matter what, but I don't know. Also, remember the baklava mask they found? Because they found it like a block away or something from the house. His DNA was all over that. He was at the scene of the... I mean, the, the, there were fucking witnesses to it. Why did you need her testimony? You don't need her testimony. You might need somebody else's testimony to convict her to say that she had something to do with it, which now you don't because you have her statements, which obviously a defendant's statements aren't always accurate and blah, blah, blah. But anyway... I think she would have been convicted as well. I wish they had not done this. I really don't understand it. But anyway, they believe that the gun used in the murders was taken from the property room of the police department that Tim worked at before he resigned. On the stand, Charlene testified that she was the one who told him to do it, and he did it. Tim's defense attacked Charlene's credibility because of how much she lied throughout everything. But in the end, it only took the jury four hours to convict Tim Dean of double murder. Now, Charlene says, Charlene says, still to this day, that Amber was never part of the plan, that she shouldn't have been part of it. Tim just kind of went rogue. She never wanted Charlene to die. And Josh and Amber's moms were like, okay, well, if that's true, then how did Tim know to show up at the house right when she gets home every day with the kid? Like, he didn't have to shoot her. Maybe she showed up and he thought she would recognize him. I don't know if he ever met Amber or not. I don't know. Anyway, he got convicted. He was given life in prison. Braun Bowler got one to three years for secondary, or I'm sorry, second degree conspiracy and was released in November of 2020. Charlene got 28 years. She sits 
down to camera in the Dateline episode. Fucking bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off. Dennis said, not today. Not today, Satan. I don't think so. Toward the end of the episode, she, he's like, do you have any remorse? Like, do you feel bad about killing two people? Do you know how much pain and suffering you caused so many people? You caused your children to live the rest of their lives without their father and much of their lives without their mother because you got fucking busted, you dumb bitch. And she was like, yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I, you know, he's like, are you even sad that two people are dead? Like, are you sad? Do you feel bad about it? I feel horrible about it. He's like, you know what, Charlene? I got to tell you, I don't know what true remorse or feeling terrible looks like. I don't think I'm seeing it here. I got to tell you, you were selfish. You killed two people because you wanted what you wanted when you wanted it. And then she's like, I need a break. And she goes and talks to her attorney and she comes back and now she's crying. I'm sure her attorney was like, I told you not to fucking do that interview. And now you're looking bad. And this is not going to look good for the parole board because they're going to get a hold of this fucking interview. So you better go in there and show some tears and act like you actually feel sorry about this. I mean, I can't know that, but that's what I think happened because she came back and was like, like sniffly, whatever. Anyway, well done, Dennis. Well done. You tell her. But you guys let me know what you think about this. And um, oh, and also update. Okay, so Gabby and Brentley, Brent Bentley, sorry, Gabby and Bentley went to live with Josh's family. And yes, they live with Josh's, they lived with Josh's family. And then Josh Jr. lived with one of the parents. Gosh, and I'm so sorry. I can't remember if it was Amber's parents or Josh's parents. But Josh Jr. lived with them and they've got great care for him. You know, he's nonverbal, but they said he laughs, he smiles. They have pictures of Amber and Josh everywhere. They talk about them all the time. So he's able to at least remember them in some way. And they said he's, you know, he's doing well. He's a happy kid. Um, and he's okay. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta feel so terrible for these kids. All of them, Tim's kids. Uh, however many he has, I'm not totally sure. I know the video was just the one daughter, but like Charlene has other kids. She's a kid with Jace, who's not going to see his mom anymore. Like temper tantrum. The, I always say that a murder is a, the largest temper tantrum you can have. Grow up. But anyway, that's the end. I love you guys. See you next week. If you like this episode, be sure to like this episode and follow the show so that you never miss out on new episodes. Get in on the conversation on Facebook and Instagram. You can find us at Killer Queens Pod, or you can join our Facebook discussion group at Killer Queens Podcast, where we discuss cases covered on the show and all things 90s. If you want to submit a case to be covered on the show, visit KillerQueensPodcast.com slash case submission and just complete the form. And if we cover the case, we'll give you a shout out on the show. Lilas. Bye.